Military helicopters play a vital role in sea, land, and air operations. They monitor, reconnoiter, and provide fire support. The Special Forces also rely on the mobility and flexibility of helicopters. The requirements of helicopters for Special Forces are diverse, of course. That's the H-145M, one of the newest helicopters we have. Helicopters are used in rescue, transport, and combat missions. I've got a contact at a distance of around 1,700 yards. Helicopters have been used by the German Armed Forces for over 60 years. Fast, accurate, and feared. Okay, now we switch on the first engine. Five clock, your engine main switch. Three, two, one, idle. Rock start. Idle, start to engage. The successful deployment of helicopters is often a matter of life or death. Its maneuverability and transport capacity make it an irreplaceable and reliable transport helicopter. NATO helicopter NH-90. In the future, we will send up both autonomous and partially autonomous helicopters. Grafenwehr in Bavaria. The pilots of 64 Helicopter Wing are practicing a medevac mission, a medical evacuation, together with Navy Special Forces and Army paratroopers. Quick, off we go, pick him up. Air Force type H-145M helicopters are in the air to protect the Special Forces from further attacks. The Air Force is securing the mission area under combat conditions while the wounded are stabilized and then transported to a provisional landing zone. Besides the two pilots, the crew includes at least one tactical operator. On a mission, he also acts as a door gunner and provides fire protection during an evacuation. This has to do with self-protection. We have the option of protecting the helicopter from outside the helicopter, particularly during the landing phase. For example, when we're landing in a combat zone to rescue a wounded soldier. The transport helicopters don't carry any weapons. Landing to pick up the wounded is the most critical part of the mission. The rescue helicopter offers an easy target for enemy fire, even if the landing zone is secured by other forces in the air and on the ground. The H-145M LUH SOF is fast and quiet. Optimum conditions for the deployment scenario. The agile aircraft is the preferred means of transport of special forces. The requirements of the helicopters for special forces are diverse, of course. It's a real package. The aircraft has to be operational worldwide, irrespective of climatic conditions or the geographical location. Reliability plays a major role too, of course, also in terms of readiness. It has to be quick, we have to be deployable quickly to be able to transport personnel. But we also have to support the firefight from the air or help our comrades on the ground with reconnaissance. However, the LUH is actually an aircraft that's very reliable and genuinely fulfills its purpose. The light helicopter was introduced by the German Armed Forces for its special forces. 64 helicopter wing has a total of 15 aircraft. Two gas turbines, each with an output of 771 horsepower, accelerate the multi-purpose helicopter, which has an unladen weight of only 1.8 metric tons, to its maximum speed of 268 kilometers per hour. Its payload, passengers, fuel, and weapons, is an additional 1.8 metric tons. With a range of 663 kilometers, the H-145M has a maximum altitude of just over 6,000 meters. The aircraft offers space for up to 11 people. Wing Commander Stefan Bauer is a pilot and the head of the Further Development Unit in 64 Helicopter Wing. He knows the Special Forces helicopter inside and out. First, some general information. That's our H-145M LUH SOF, one of the newest German Armed Forces helicopters that we have. We used a civilian model to speed up procurement, and we've adapted this model for our purposes. What you can see at the front here is our camera system. It's a high-performance system with multiple day and night cameras, a laser for measuring distances and other details that I can't go into. All I can say is that it's one of the best camera systems we currently have. 
Besides additional armoring, the H145M is equipped with an electronic self-defense system and thus guarantees a high level of safety in action. If the system detects enemy rocket fire, it automatically fires magnesium flares. At a temperature of up to 2,000 degrees Celsius, these are aimed at deceiving incoming rockets and diverting them from the helicopter. As squadron commander, Wing Commander Nolte leads the helicopter crews into action. The aircraft is tactically flown in different variations, meaning that we might be underway with one aircraft or with four or six, depending on our core mission. For us, that means, for instance, that we can offer security with one aircraft and use another aircraft to pick up forces from the ground or set them down again, transport them elsewhere, etc., etc. So we've got a hell of a lot of variation. The Special Forces helicopter can be armed with two MG6 miniguns. Two tactical operators operate the two MGs. They each have a 180-degree field of vision in the target area and can therefore provide effective fire support from the air. The MG6 operates according to the Gatling principle. Thanks to the six rotating barrels, the weapon has a rate of fire of up to 3,000 rounds per minute and can engage targets located up to 1,200 meters away. The battery for the 6 MG barrels electric drive is located in the helicopter's rear cargo area. The ammunition is fed via a belt channel from the ammunition boxes to the weapon. The two magazines can each hold 4,000 rounds. The H145M has full night combat capabilities. Tracer ammunition that makes aiming easier is then always fired. Unlike using the gun sight for fire during the day, the TAC op monitors the tracer rounds in the dark and uses them to aim his weapon at the respective target. Missions at night also present the pilots with particular challenges. Their field of vision is then severely restricted because they can only use their night vision devices for orientation. This is why the crews constantly practice these special mission scenarios. Many of the helicopters used by the German armed forces come from the Airbus plant in Donauwörth, Bavaria. Here, around 7,000 employees build four different helicopter models. The H-145M Special Forces helicopter is also produced here. Production of the lightweight helicopter begins with cutting carbon and fiberglass cloth to size. Later on, these two materials are used to produce high-tech carbon fiber material. What's special about this is that carbon fiber is extremely strong and very light. This material is carbon fiber fabric, individual fibers that are sealed with a resin system. Previously, classic aircraft construction actually involved aluminum, but the trend is increasingly shifting to carbon fiber because it is a very light material. That also makes the helicopter lighter, meaning that it can remain in the air for longer. Each of the four rotor blades weighs 40 kilograms, is 5 meters long, and rotates at around 380 revolutions per minute. What are called the rotor stars are produced in the machining department. High-tech milling cutters shape the forged titanium blanks accurately to a thousandth of a millimeter. Maximum demands are made on component quality because the star has to run absolutely concentrically and free of vibrations later on. This 15 kilogram rotor star is finished. It has a value of around 25,000 euros. In the main component assembly shop, the cabin frame is riveted to the helicopter airframe. These connections are far more flexible than threaded connections or weld seams. Next door, 50 employees are installing the electrical cables. Several kilometers of cables are used in each aircraft. Depending on the helicopter, the work takes up to 18 days. The center console is the basis for the cabling where all of the devices for the pilot and co-pilot are mounted. This is where it gets specific, which devices, which displays are available to the pilot. Above all, what kind of customer is it? And what functions does the customer need? 
The military version, the H145M LUH SOF, is fitted with what's currently the most modern onboard electronics system in the world, Helionics. In final assembly, the two engines are mounted on the helicopter's roof. They will drive the rotors later on. Each of the two engines weighs 135 kilograms. A heat-resistant carbon panel seals the drive. Now the helicopter's tail boom can be mounted. Fitting out the interior takes 10 days. The aircraft mechanics install 11 of these interior trims. All of the cables are then also hidden. The military equipment, such as brackets for the onboard weapons, radio equipment, seats, and the safety technology for the tactical operator, for instance, is then installed in the interior later on. The helicopter is additionally fitted with a repelling device. After a good four months, the moment has finally arrived. A brand new helicopter is ready for the German Special Forces military operations. In the North Sea, the frigate Schleswig-Holstein is hunting submarines. Enemy submarine units pose a particular hazard. Locating and combating enemy submarines in action is one of the German Navy's main tasks. The Schleswig-Holstein uses its two shipboard Sea Lynx type helicopters to defend against submarines. One Lynx is used to locate the target and the second aircraft engages it with its two torpedoes. Captain Lars Scheuer is one of the two pilots taking part in today's exercise. When we take off from the ship, we usually do so with so-called alert statuses. There's alert 60, alert 30 and alert 10. The latter is the highest alert status. With that, we have to be in the air within 10 minutes. Thanks to their range and speed, the Sea Lynx shipboard helicopters significantly extend the German warship's action radius. One of the basic prerequisites for the early detection of and successful defense against enemy submarines. The hunters maintain constant contact with the frigate's operations center and report any potential enemy contact. To do this, the Sea Lynx MK-88A is equipped with a dipping sonar, an all-round radar, and an infrared sensor. The Sea Lynx crew consists of three soldiers, the pilot, the co-pilot, and an operator. The latter operates the sensitive and depth-adjustable sonar for underwater detection. The second Sea Lynx carries an MU-90 anti-submarine torpedo. Guided by the frigate to the approximate target area, the helicopter now hovers over the probable contact and dips its sonar into the North Sea. While the pilots keep the Sea Lynx steady, the operator can use the sonar to search for noises, such as those caused by ship's propellers. The helicopter can also emit echo signals that are reflected by a potential target. The operator's ability to determine with his ears whether the sonar echo is really from a submarine is crucial to the success of the mission. Particularly in the passive range, meaning when we're just listening, we can determine a direction from which the contact, let's call it a submarine, is coming, but we can't determine a distance. We hear a noise source, for example, meaning a noise underwater, and we can tell which direction it's coming from. If we then go active to refine the search, so to speak, we actively emit a signal ourselves. Then we can evaluate the echo from the contact to determine the direction and the distance. From center back to all, TAC operator, 
and I've got a contact at a distance of around 1,700 yards. But I don't have a direction yet. The messages from the helicopter sonar operator are received by the so-called anti-submarine officer in the Schleswig-Holstein's operations center. He adds the data that the ship has collected with its maritime surveillance systems to the helicopter's search results. The second hunter lurking in the air receives this target data and then engages the opponent with its anti-submarine torpedo. When the Sea Lynxes are not on board the frigate, they're stationed at Nordholz Air Base. Naval Air Wing 5 is responsible for operating all of the German Navy's helicopters. Corvette Captain Lars Scheuer and his comrades start their working day early in the squadron. First, there's the morning briefing. As the helicopter operations officer, Lars Scheuer prepares his comrades' instructions. To do this, he collects all deployment data of relevance to the mission. We haven't got the precise position of the ship yet. They're supposed to be somewhere in a northwesterly direction just off Helgoland, so not far from our firing area. Our firing area is marked up here, EDD-41 Alpha, with the corresponding points, with the wind farm up here. That means for the firing itself, we'll be located somewhere in the southwestern corner. That also depends a bit on which ships will be underway there. We have to stick to our safety sectors and we have to watch the weather, of course. The Sea Lynx MK-88A shipboard helicopter is an important part of the overall weapons system on the German Navy's frigates. Two Rolls-Royce turbines, each with an output of 1,000 horsepower, accelerate the 5.3 metric ton helicopter to its maximum speed of 325 kilometers per hour. It has a range of 620 kilometers and a maximum operational altitude of 3,600 meters. Besides the crew of three pilots, up to eight additional people can be transported with the Sea Lynx. The German Navy pilots have 22 Sea Lynx MK-88As at their disposal. After the briefing, the crews of the two mission helicopters proceed to the pre-flight checks on their aircraft. We walk around the entire aircraft once and check everything here. We call it the pre-flight. Here, for example, that the screws are all tight. That the plug up there is present. The fin is stable, not loose. That the light's OK. The rotor blades of the tail rotor. Then there's the transmission oil level. It's OK. The intermediate transmission's oil level is OK too. It's looking good. The North Sea is the two helicopter crew's destination today. They're heading to a firing exercise in the German Bight near Helgoland. Corvette Captain Lars Scheuer has already been deployed twice to the central Mediterranean as part of the international Uniform Med Irini mission with his Sea Lynx. In this military operation, the European Union is enforcing the United Nations weapons embargo against Libya. That also involves locating and searching suspicious ships in the operational area. Time and again, the Sea Lynx crew encounters large merchant vessels in the North Sea. Particularly off the coast of Somalia, such ships also run the risk of being attacked by pirates. German Armed Forces soldiers have foiled such attacks on numerous occasions and arrested the attackers. The Commodore of Naval Air Wing 5, Frigate Captain Karsten Holtgreve, is familiar with such scenarios. Naval Air Wing 5 supports the German Armed Forces in their tasks worldwide, of course up to and including the deployment of special forces who are set down as part of boarding, for instance, on ocean-going vessels that have to be inspected, freighters, container ships, and so on. And that's exactly what the German Armed Forces soldiers practice time and again, fast roping down from the Navy's Sea Lynx helicopter. 
This time, the specialists of Airborne Engineer Company 270 from Seedorf, Lower Saxony, are on board in Nordholz. What works well during the day also has to function at night. The soldiers have to land precisely on the ships and then be able to immediately engage in combat. The German Armed Forces specialized units also practice this frequently. Corvette Captain Lars Scheuer and his crew have now arrived in their exercise area in the German Bight. The door gunner now runs through various procedures for warning a small, agile, inflatable dinghy with short, precise bursts of fire. The intention is to make it depart from its original course and force it to give up. In an emergency, the presumed pirate boat will be specifically fired on with the M3M machine gun. Such maneuvers necessitate an experienced helicopter team and make particularly high demands on the pilot. He has to keep the helicopter steady and stable and fly the door gunner as close to the target as possible while remaining out of range of enemy fire if he can. That requires good training and lots of experience. First of all, I would distinguish between basic training when we transform a young person into a pilot and the subsequent deployment training when we prepare this young person for a mission. The objective of that is slightly different. While the first phase of the training is focused on a young pilot being able to operate the helicopter in their sleep, the second phase is aimed at actually using the helicopter and ultimately delivering its combat value as well as possible where it's needed to the land forces that are being supported. And that means that we constantly have to shift the focus during the training. But the goal of the training as a whole, of course, is to have a deployable crew that can rely on one another and are so familiar with each operation that they can carry it out. When you wake them in the middle of the night and need something done, the operations have to be ingrained. Then there's no need to think, but flying the helicopter has to come automatically. And then I can concentrate on the mission and what I'm actually supposed to be doing with the helicopter. Okay, then we switch on the first engine. My class, rear engine main switch. Three, two, one, idle. Rock start. Idle, starter engaged. Loader turning. Bürkeburg in Lower Saxony. Lieutenant Daniel Hüser and his trainee pilot, Sebastian Adam, are about to start today's training flight. Lineup 6, yeah, line up in Bravo. Wind 360 degrees, 400. Exactly. 360, Bravo direct. Okay, take off check. All future German Armed Forces helicopter pilots complete their basic flight training in the EC-135 training helicopter. Trainee pilot, Lieutenant Sebastian Adam, has already successfully completed his theoretical and initial training on the simulator. The German Armed Forces International Helicopter Training Center is located here in Bückeburg. It's the central training facility for the Army, Air Force, and Navy, as well as for international training participants. Here, the trainee pilots not only learn how to operate a helicopter according to visual flight rules, but can also qualify for instrument flying and what's called sensor flying during low-level night flying. Two turbo mecha engines, each with 643 horsepower, give the EC-135 a maximum speed of 260 kilometers per hour. The 2.8-ton helicopter has a range of 625 kilometers. Its maximum operational altitude is 6,000 meters. Besides the two-person crew, the helicopter has space for up to three passengers. The EC-135 is one of the world's most popular helicopters for military flight training. It's also used in civil air rescue and by police forces. The helicopter has a glass cockpit equipped with modern instruments, similar to that of the Tiger attack helicopter, the CH-53GA and the NH-90. High numbers of all three helicopter types are used by the German armed forces. The preparation for a so-called navigation flight is another important element of the pilot training. 
For this, trainee pilot Lieutenant Sebastian Adam has been given a specific flight assignment in advance. The destination of today's training flight is a German Armed Forces airfield around 50 kilometers away. We'll take off in Bukeborg, depending on VAD. There are two big industrial areas here with accordingly high chimneys. We'll have to watch out that we don't get too close to them. Okay. Temperature 20 degrees, all safe. Flight feasible? Flight feasible. Suitability as an officer is the basic requirement for training as a pilot in the German Armed Forces. The subsequent basic helicopter pilot training takes around 17 months. This is followed by continuation training on the weapon system that is assigned. Depending on service and helicopter type, the status of mission pilot is achieved after roughly three to four years. The two pilots are now proceeding to a German Armed Forces outside landing site in Sulingen, where the trainee pilot is to practice landing his helicopter quickly but precisely. Such maneuvers are important because time is a risk factor in critical situations. No matter whether in freeing hostages or in an armed conflict, the faster the helicopter can set soldiers down and fly off, the lower the risk of it being shot down. Good. Good. Okay, left side's looking good. good off. Okay, turning left now. We're going to grace the ceiling and outside landing set with our presence. This is where the trainee pilots also completed their first flying maneuvers. It's great for flying circuits here as well as practicing taking off, landing, hovering, and everything that's important. 500 speed, 65 knots. Space is right. Second coach is down here, right? Yes. And I'm going to start in three, two, one, now. Yes. Now you'll have to raise it a little again. Yes, was a certain. A little bit low. Right. And remember, there's no wind. Yes, it's it's just straight here. Exactly. Down to the ground. Down to the ground. In the battle. Contact that craft stationery. I thought the circuit was pretty good. Yeah. You did well, you just have to watch out that you get the turning point right again. Yeah. Then when you start to descend, you start a bit more actively. Collective down, nose up, and then into the turn. After their training in Bukeburg, the pilots will then fly their respective aircraft types in rescue, firefighting, evacuation, and international combat missions, among others. In 1955, the German armed forces were formed as an army affiliated to NATO. The Cold War was in full swing between East and West. In 1957, the German armed forces put their first helicopters into service. The Alouette II was particularly popular in the army. Its tasks, training, reconnaissance, and transport. The light helicopter was one of the first series produced helicopters powered by a gas turbine and remained in use by the German armed forces until 2008. The Bell UH-1D, nicknamed the Huey, was introduced in the Army and Air Force in 1967. Both are a major order for the aviation industry in the Federal Republic. Licensed production of the new German armed forces helicopter, the Bell UH-1D, has been in full swing now for several weeks. One of the helicopter's most important tasks was in SAR missions in the air and sea rescue service. Around the clock, 365 days a year. SAR is the keyword. Search and rescue. The Bell UH-1D and its crew en route to the mountains from Landsberg. In SAR missions, time doesn't just cost money, but much more, perhaps somebody's life. The lifesavers of the Mountain Rescue Service are picked up quick as a flash and set down again just a few minutes later at the foot of the sheer slope. Produced under license by Dornier, for the German Armed Forces, the legendary helicopter developed an output of 1,400 horsepower. After half a century, the Huey was then put into its well-deserved retirement on April 12, 2021. The Sikorsky H-34G was also used in life-saving SAR missions. 
Put into service back in 1957 in the recently established German Armed Forces, the helicopter had space for 18 passengers or 12 stretchers. The H-34G also flew with Naval Air Wing 5 from 1963 to 1975. Of SAR. Naval Air Wing 5 in Kiel Holtenau is specialized in SAR missions. It stands ready day and night with its satellite stations on the North Sea Islands of Borkum and Silt. The Bo 105P, which entered service as the PAH-1 anti-tank helicopter in 1979, was a product of the Cold War. It was intended to effectively engage the Warsaw Pact's tank divisions, which were far superior to those of NATO in terms of their numbers. And that's the aim of the exercise. Sometimes just centimeters above the ground, the PAH creeps up, climbs briefly, targets an enemy tank and fires a rocket. Three, two, one, fire. Hit. Perhaps a second one too. And then quickly changes its position so that the enemy can't tell where the attack came from. The Bo 105M, an aircraft with numerous possible variations and uses. The indispensable B for the army. During the Cold War, of course, one of our focuses was to defend our country as well as possible against potential opponents. And it was important, for example, to establish airborne anti-tank capabilities and to put them into practice and further develop them. But the transport tasks were at least equally as important because the ground troops need flexibility, speed and options for quickly shifting their focus. The Sikorsky CH-53 was also put into service in the 70s. Now the army has its own jumbo too, the CH-53G, the elephant among the West's airborne cargo carriers. Because no other helicopter can carry as much as quickly as the newcomer. Its older, but smaller brothers in the troops, such as the Alouette or the Bell UH-1D, have been noticing that in recent months. It is displacing, replacing, or supplementing them. The CH-53 was used by the German armed forces to transport personnel and material, and for special military tasks. When we refused to believe, the army pilots in Bukaborg went to great pains to convince us. 38 fully equipped soldiers can be accommodated quickly and comfortably in the new Sikorsky. A total of 112 CH-53 type helicopters were purchased by the German armed forces. Deployed there since 1975, four different model series of the aircraft were used as medium transport helicopters. Today's German armed forces are intensively focused on international missions within NATO regiments. Following experience gained in initial multinational missions abroad, the combat value of 20 helicopters was enhanced to create the CH-53 GS variant up to 2002. GS stands for German Special. They're armored, equipped with machine guns and fitted with electronic warfare systems. They also have night and low-level flying capabilities. The GA variant is also new. This abbreviation stands for German Advanced. This setup enables them to fight in tandem with the Tiger attack helicopter and the NH-90 transport helicopter. The CH-53 is also used for special missions, such as conducting military evacuation operations, as well as abduction and hostage situations. Fireblade, one of Europe's biggest military helicopter exercises. Here, five nations are practicing international cooperation for future missions with 14 helicopters and 450 soldiers and three CH-53s from the Air Transport Group of Helicopter Squadron 64 from Holzdorf are right in the middle of the action. Joint firing, landing, and medevac missions are practiced. All scenarios that await the various nations' armed forces on their international deployments. Besides personnel repatriation, the helicopter crews practice setting down and picking up special forces intensively.
This also includes training over desert floors, a rather difficult undertaking. Here, the CH-53 crews have to anticipate tricky brownout situations in which masses of fine desert sand are swirled up by the main rotor without losing their bearings. The 64 helicopter wing air transport group is stationed at Holzdorf Air Base. The training for pilots is carried out here at this site, for door gunners and for technical personnel, of course. Together, they then serve as part of a crew here on board the CH-53, the biggest transport helicopter in the German armed forces. We essentially provide young pilots and young crew members with further training here, from more theoretical to practical flight training. It all starts with what's called a type rating, meaning that you're familiarized with the weapons system and then undertake tactical training later on. The CH-53 medium transport helicopter has been used for over 40 years by the German armed forces for transporting personnel and material. Small military vehicles can also be loaded in the CH-53's cargo bay via a rear ramp. Two engines, each delivering 4,330 horsepower, enable a maximum speed of 295 kilometers per hour. The CH-53 has a range of 625 kilometers. Weighing up to 19,050 kilograms, the helicopter can reach a maximum operational altitude of 2,750 meters. Besides the four-man crew, the cargo bay can accommodate up to 36 people. Loud engine noises announce its arrival. A CH-53 is approaching Holzdorf. The giant transport helicopter is very popular and well-liked among German armed forces soldiers, despite being rather old. Its powerful engines, its extremely robust design, and by no means least, its highly specialized pilots, ground engineers, and mechanics make the CH-53 a reliable combat and transport aircraft. Sergeant First Class Tom Lange is co-responsible for the trouble-free deployment of the helicopter. The technical service is responsible for ensuring the aircraft's flight safety so that pilots can take off, carry out their flight orders, and land again safely. We're also responsible for carrying out the pre-flight and post-flight inspections, as well as both non-planable and planable inspections, and the flight inspection services. The effort needed to maintain the aging aircraft is enormous. Although the CH-53 has had numerous electronic and mechanical upgrades in recent years, the 64 helicopter wing mechanics and ground engineers have to put in maximum performance each and every day to keep the squadron's airborne trucks operational. We check the engines for leaks to make sure that fuel or oil isn't escaping anywhere. And also the sensitive engine control system components to make sure that no fuel or other fluids are leaking. Missions in Afghanistan for 18 years have left their mark on the aircraft. The technology on the numerous CH-53s wore out quickly. Flight safety is always the top priority for the ground engineers. Before and after every flight, we check that the emergency lowering system for the landing gear is still intact, that it hasn't triggered, and also that everything's fastened properly, and that there are no loose fasteners anywhere, or leaks. However, it's not yet certain when a modern digitalized helicopter with the latest communications and data transmission systems will be introduced in the German armed forces. The service life of the CH-53 fleet in the German armed forces is planned to continue into the 2030s. There are up to three door gunners on board the CH-53. They engage the enemy with type M3M heavy machine guns. The MGs are mounted on special carriages on the rear ramp and at the helicopter side openings. This modern weapon is extremely robust and rarely malfunctions. And at the end of the day, it's important that all of the aircraft are ready and safe to fly. The operational readiness of the CH-53 transport helicopter is now the lowest of all of the German Armed Forces weapons systems. 
To relieve it and to increase operational readiness, the German armed forces have now purchased the NATO Helicopter 90 or NH-90. At present, the German army has 82 and the Navy 18 NH-90s in their fleet. The army essentially uses the new helicopter for tactical transport missions, but it's also deployed in an armed escort role. Two Rolls-Royce turbines, each delivering a good 2,400 horsepower, give the helicopter a maximum speed of around 300 kilometers per hour. It has a range of 1,000 kilometers. Weighing 11,400 kilograms, the heavy-duty multi-purpose helicopter can reach a maximum operational altitude of 6,000 meters. Besides the crew of three soldiers, the NH-90 can transport up to 20 additional people. The NH-90's cockpit is equipped with four multifunction displays. They display all relevant data to the pilot. The flight helmet is a special piece of equipment. A variety of data is shown to the pilot directly on his visor, such as information on where the pilot sitting next to him is currently looking. This means that both always have the same information and can react quickly, particularly during low-level flying. Like the CH-53, the NH-90 is also equipped with a tailgate. Time and again, the German Armed Forces soldiers practice boarding using the electrically lowering ramp at the rear. All involved have to be familiar with the tactical procedure because speed is of the essence on a mission. The infantrymen have to be able to get into and out of the helicopter quickly. In here, we operate two variants of the NH-90 in the Army. Firstly, the transport helicopter variant, and secondly, the med-evac helicopter. That means we can equip this helicopter so that we basically have an ambulance complete with everything that an ambulance needs, so that we can fly injured, wounded, or even severely wounded soldiers directly out from the battlefield. It performs both of these roles well. The equipment is what I would term very modern. And thanks to its size, it's not too big and not too small, its agility remains good, so that it can operate very well even in the airspace close to the ground. The NH-90 is a high-tech helicopter. All of its systems are digitally controlled and monitored. The military helicopter has a special dust filter system for its engine and a powerful radio antenna along the entire left side of the cabin. This enables communication over extremely long distances. The aircraft is therefore designed for international missions and difficult terrain from the ground up. The pilot's control commands are transferred using a fly-by-wire system to the flight computer and from there to a control computer. For safety purposes, the systems offer up to fourfold redundancy. The NH-90 is mainly manufactured using lightweight carbon. Besides the advantage of its lower weight, its own radar echo is significantly reduced as a result. This modern helicopter has considerably changed flying missions in the German armed forces. Again and again, the armed forces are also deployed when natural disasters occur in Germany. And in recent years, their ability to fight fires has become increasingly important. The summers are becoming hotter and drier, resulting in widespread forest fires and wildfires. The fire department is increasingly calling in support to tackle them effectively. German armed forces helicopters are therefore helping the fire crews to fight fires more and more frequently. There are specified very strict alarm channels. If, for example, a district has a major fire situation, it can request helicopter support via the Ministry of the Interior's Situation Center, including the support of the German Armed Forces. Lechfeld in Bavaria. Cooperation between the military, police, fire department and civilian forces poses a challenge each and every time because communication and procedures have to be perfectly coordinated during a mission. 
That's the point of what we're doing here. You can't coordinate everything. We never usually know where we are. That's the challenge. You're spread apart. As the military, we're used to it all. It shouldn't be a problem. The helicopters are supposed to draw the extinguishing water from a nearby lake and then fly as quickly as possible to the seat of the fire. Flooded gravel pit, watch out. It's really deep. The lake surface is about 10, 15 meters below ground level. The external extinguishing water containers, called Smoky, with a capacity of 5,000 liters, now have to be attached to the helicopters as quickly as possible by the ground forces. Besides the two pilots, the helicopter crew consists of three flight engineers who support the pilots when taking on water and during the extinguishing process. One of these soldiers is used exclusively as a smoky operator. The helicopter crews are in contact with the forces on the ground by radio and coordinate the attachment of the extinguishing water container. 5,000 liters is an enormous quantity of extinguishing water. At the right approach, speed and altitude, it can extinguish developing fires very efficiently. These supposedly small containers are the biggest that there are here in Bavaria. There are far smaller ones, 1,500 liters, 900 liters, 800 liters. And the CH-53 really is the most effective tool for fighting fires. The helicopters now fly off towards the flooded gravel pit with the smoky under their fuselage. The container has a bottom valve that can be opened and closed from the helicopter by the operator. The CH-53 crew in the air has to work together perfectly to ensure that the water is picked up successfully and without an accident. A lot can happen on a firefighting mission like this. The container can get caught in branches at the bottom of the lake when we are scooping up the water, of course. Branches can get into the valve so that we can't close the container. Then we have to return to the landing site again. A branch can get caught on the control cable somewhere in the water, and then I can't open the container any longer. I have 5,000 liters of water attached to the helicopter, and I can't get rid of it. I have to set the full container down somewhere. It's also a critical point when a helicopter reaches its performance limit, of course. With temperatures like today, of course it can also happen that the helicopter has a technical problem and then has to jettison this container intentionally. We do that in an area where nobody's around. Things like that and what's to be done in such cases are discussed in briefings prior to the start of the mission, and then there are areas where we jettison such things so that nobody is harmed. The Smoky is filled with 5,000 liters of extinguishing water, an enormous external load that's now pulling on the helicopter. The pilots have to factor that in precisely in advance and fly with far less fuel than usual so that the CH-53's engines aren't overloaded. The forest fire is simulated with burning containers by the local fire department. The pilots are highly concentrated they have to keep a watchful eye on the terrain so that they don't fly too high or too low. Now, the smoky operator has to open the water container's bottom valve via an electronic control signal. The time window is extremely short because the CH-53 has flown over the seat of the fire in a matter of seconds. The success or failure of the mission depends on these few seconds. the German armed forces in combined arms battle. Dismounted infantry, reconnaissance by Heron 1 drones, powerful armored units such as the Leopard 2, all fighting in combination against the enemy. In this process, forces and equipment are bundled to enhance their impact. Firepower and movement, these are the most important elements in combined arms battle. If we don't practice how we fight, maybe we shouldn't fight, because then we might be caught off guard by things that we don't want to catch us off guard. That means it's also important for the helicopter pilot and the helicopter crew to practice with the ground troops, and that they practice exactly how the ground troops fight so that they can provide them with the best possible support. Anything else would be nonsensical. The Tigers of Combat Helicopter Regiment 36 from Fritzla are also taking part. The Tiger is one of the most modern attack helicopters in the world. It engages enemy targets in the air and on the ground at low level. 
supports friendly forces, and has battlefield reconnaissance capability. The Tiger can be equipped with a mix of weapons consisting of HOT-3 guided anti-tank missiles, PARS 3LR guided missiles, unguided 70 millimeter rockets, a heavy 12.7 millimeter machine gun, and Stinger missiles. The objective of using the Tiger on the German Armed Forces international missions is to deter enemy forces by the attack helicopter's mere presence. The opponent is located in contact with the friendly forces on the ground. The Tiger's radii of action are then set out by the flight leader and the mission is coordinated. In the event that weapons are used, the enemy forces are then specifically engaged by the Tiger. Combat Helicopter Regiment 36 Kurhessen is the last of the German Armed Forces Combat Helicopter Regiments. Its job is to provide fire support for all of the armed forces from the airspace close to the ground. That includes defending against tanks from the air, engaging high-value targets, either independently or as support, escorting air transport operations, clearing landing zones, and wide-ranging surveillance and reconnaissance on the flanks of friendly forces. Colonel Schmuck is an experienced pilot and is familiar with the ins and outs of the Tiger. The attack helicopter proved particularly valuable on deployment in Afghanistan and Mali. Following these international missions, Colonel Schmuck now faces the important task of gearing the regiment and his Tigers up for territorial and alliance defense. To accomplish this, Combat Helicopter Regiment 36 has a hard-hitting and ultra-modern weapons system in the form of the Tiger. Two powerful engines, each with around 1,200 horsepower, give the helicopter a maximum speed of 268 kilometers per hour. It has a range of 671 kilometers. Weighing up to 6.1 tons, the helicopter has a maximum operational altitude of 4,000 meters. The crew consists of a pilot and a gunner. The special feature of the Tiger Attack helicopter is its mast-mounted sight with cameras and a laser rangefinder. This gives it an advantage over its opponent in that it can remain completely undercover while monitoring the battlefield and identifying targets. To protect its crew, the airframe is additionally protected with composite armor. The so-called aero tiles are bolted on and are intended to offer the most effective ballistic protection possible against various forms of attack. The Tiger's fuselage is particularly slender and therefore has a very low radar signature. Thanks to the latest night vision and thermal imaging equipment, the attack helicopter is able to both fly and engage in combat at night. This is an important military prerequisite because only troops who can fight at night are 100% operational. The Tiger's crew consists of two soldiers, the pilot and the weapon system officer. What's special about the Tiger is that it's the only helicopter where the crew sits behind one another, so we can't look one another in the eye and engage in nonverbal communication. Everything has to happen based on trust and talking. And flying a Tiger is pure passion, particularly at low level, just above obstacles in forests. It's a real challenge, but a lot of fun at the same time. The production of the Tiger is a joint European project. The front fuselage with the cockpit, the rotor blades, and the rotor hub are manufactured at the Airbus Helicopters plant in Donauwörth, near Augsburg. Other parts of the attack helicopter are produced in France and Spain. Final assembly of the German version of the Tiger then takes place in Donauwörth. The Tiger's airframe consists largely of modern composite materials. The parts are bonded together layer by layer using prefabricated fiber sheets. A very laborious and time-consuming production method, but well worthwhile compared to using metal. This makes the attack helicopter very light, gives it a very low radar signature, makes it considerably more stable and safe, and significantly reduces material fatigue. Once the components have been laminated, they're cured in a gigantic oven at high pressure and high temperature. The production process for the Tiger is organized like in the automotive industry. 
but everything here is done by hand. Before being installed, the quality of each component that is supplied is rigorously checked. Once all of the electronic systems have been installed, the cabling with a total length of 30 kilometers is dealt with. Work is now also being carried out on a new Tiger generation. The airframe is to be kept the same, but the complex electronic components for the avionics and weapons systems will be completely reconfigured. Close cooperation between France, Spain, and Germany has again been agreed on for this endeavor. As with the current Tiger, the prefabricated parts will be delivered to Donauwert and finally assembled here to form the finished attack helicopter. The most complex part of production is when the dynamic components are fitted, the electrical system is switched on and tested for the first time, and the functions of all systems are checked. Dynamic parts refer to the main and the tail rotor blades, for example, or the transmission, the link between the engine and the rotor system. It's manufactured from titanium alloys and has to be able to run in dry conditions for up to 30 minutes in the event of oil loss. Two twin shaft engines power the attack helicopter. Both engines are also made of titanium and therefore only weigh around 170 kilograms each. Once the Tiger has been completed, it's really put through its paces by the in-house pilots before being delivered. In total, the production of the Tiger takes roughly six months. It takes 20,000 hours of work to build a Tiger like this one here. It takes around 17,000 drawing parts, 30 kilometers of cables, and with all bolts and rivets, around 120,000 parts before it can fly. And that comes with a hefty price tag. Depending on configuration, a German Armed Forces Tiger attack helicopter costs up to 55 million euros. Fritzla in northern Hessen. Three Tigers from Combat Helicopter Regiment 36 are being prepared for takeoff. The precise objective of today's exercise is still top secret. The pilots are only given their orders shortly before takeoff. An important deployment scenario is going to be practiced today on a small field concealed between forests in Hessen. The helicopters are supposed to resupply at a so-called FARP, a secret forward arming and refueling point in the combat zone. That means refueling and taking on new ammunition under field conditions. Yeah. The FARP, or Forward Arming and Refueling Point, is the logistical Achilles heel of any Tiger operation. Just imagine, the flight is providing a battalion or a brigade with anti-tank support from the air. It's fired its ammunition and instead of returning to an FOB, it's quickly rearmed and refueled at this FARP so it can immediately continue to provide support again. The range of the special forces or attack helicopters is often insufficient for longer operations in the combat zone. To avoid having to fly back to the actual base, the forward operating base or FOB, the aircraft are refueled and rearmed at these improvised forward arming and refueling points. This is a standard NATO procedure and has to be practiced regularly. Resupply takes a maximum of 30 minutes, after which the aircraft take off again fully combat ready. The FARP is highly mobile and relocates to a new site immediately after resupplying. This is intended to effectively prevent possible discovery and destruction by the enemy. If possible, the FARP is supported by having other helicopters such as the CH-53 transport ammunition and fuel. Naturally, the FARP itself is a high-value target for a potential enemy because then he can prevent the attack helicopters from operating since they're no longer supplied. Accordingly, we have to make sure that the FARP remains hidden or concealed for as long as possible so we can unexpectedly resupply the helicopters just in time and then disappear again after resupplying them. The time spent on the ground by the Tigers is kept as short as possible because the next helicopters are already waiting to be resupplied. The helicopters fly in and out, like in a Formula One pit stop. These special operations are constantly practiced by the crews and the ground troops, under combat conditions. In action, only a smooth procedure guarantees battle readiness and therefore survival. The German armed forces put their first helicopters into service shortly after being formed. 
Since then, they've been used in rescue, transport, and combat missions. These have recently been joined by the tactical deployment of Army, Air Force, and Navy Special Forces. On the battlefields of the 21st century, helicopters have long since assumed a major role in resupply, evacuation, and combat. In the future, we will be sending up both autonomous and partially autonomous helicopters. That means human-machine interface. We want to try to use artificial intelligence. That is a really crucial keyword. The networking of helicopters with one another. Also, the use of drones that can autonomously support the deployment of helicopters with artificial intelligence. It's a complex system. Development work has started in this area. We've already seen in various crisis situations what it means to experience drone swarm intelligence. We have to keep up. We have to keep pace. That's why I believe that the future of helicopters involves keeping humans in the loop, because they ultimately have to decide. They also have to decide ethically what they're doing on a mission. But then, have as many unmanned support options as possible around these people in their aircraft in order to protect and support them.